Hey, super scientists, we're taking a look at biological evolution. So we're going to look at different examples of natural selection and then also some examples of biological evolution. So if you take a look at this picture, see if you can find the insect in the picture. It's hanging down right here. So you have a uh, walking stick or a stick bug and it is blending in. It's camouflaged, kind of um, looks like the wheatgrass that you have right here. So that's one example that we're going to be looking at. Camouflage. There are different types of adaptations that organisms may have to make them suited to their environment. So an adaptation is going to be something that helps an animal or organism to survive. Something that will be a beneficial trait to them. Camouflage is one thing you're probably familiar with. If you look at the different pictures over here, we have some examples of different organisms and how they have adapted that will allow them to survive in their environment. So the snow fox that we have right here, of course, is going to be camouflaged. It blends in within its environment, has white fur, and that blends in with the white snow. Defense mechanisms. Having something that's sharp and prickly like the porcupine or something that allows for them to sting like a scorpion or centipedes. Feeding mechanisms. The birds you see in the picture here, they are suited to have a beak that will be adapted to the type of food that is available to them. So if you have a gull or a pelican, they're able to swoop down to the surface of the ocean and that will allow them to scoop up their food because their beak has that sort of curved shape to it. Movement. There are lots of different types of ways that organisms move. We know that things that are going to fly are going to need wings. Their skeletal structure, the composition of those wings help them to be able to fly, fly quickly or fly in a certain um, pattern. And bipedal or quadrupeds, your stem ped refers to feet and then bi refers to too. So we're bipeds because we walk on two feet, whereas other organisms like cheetahs, cats, dogs, they're quadrupeds, they walk on four feet. Mudskippers are another organism that's really interesting, and this is a picture of a mudskipper. So this is a fish, and this fish, the mudskipper, is able to walk on land. It comes up out of the water, has little appendages that helps it to move along but it also lives in the water, so it's an aquatic organism that can come on land. It's really unique in that way. Survival of the fittest is one of the capstones of evolution, and sometimes you see this referred to as natural selection or related to natural selection. So survival of the fittest basically just says the organisms that are most suited, most fit, most adapted to their environment are the ones that are going to survive. So natural selection, Organisms best suited to their environment are going to be the ones that survive. The peppered moth is a perfect example of biological evolution. It's a great example of natural selection. So if you look at this example that we have here, this is tree. So you see all that um, brown or kind of black colored tree bark. This is one thing that occurred due to human impact on the environment. So think about industrial revolution, which you may have studied during social studies. So you have a lot of industries that are pumping a lot of uh, pollution and contaminants into the air. You've got a lot of soot in the air from basically developing um, mechanisms for energy and electricity. So all that soot is basically being deposited down on the ground, down on stuff that's outside, and soot is black. It's like, if you think of ash, it's like powdery kind of black ash sort of material. So that covers trees, it covers anything that's outside, and you had a lot of trees that were getting completely covered in this black soot. So this is an example of a peppered moth, and you can see the peppered moth in the picture here. It blends in really well to the types of trees that it would land on, which are these speckledy colors. However, if it's covered with black soot, like in this picture, it's going to be more evident that the peppered moth is right there. So biologically what ends up happening is the peppered moths that are evidently there because you can see that white coloration, those get eaten by birds. So what do you end up having left? You have the black peppered moths that survive. So this darker colored peppered moth, it blends in. It's now camouflaged with the soot covered tree and so you have more of this Gen this genetic material, more this DNA that codes for the blacker colored pepper moths being passed down. 
So you have an increase in the population of the black peppered moths because all the whiter speckledy peppered moths were getting eaten by birds. So if they're getting eaten, then they're not surviving. They're not passing on their DNA to future generations of peppered moths. So take a look at this video and see what is going on. What do you think all that stuff is? Ah, those are spiders hanging in the air. What's the spiders? Everywhere. So I don't know about you, but I would not be walking around with spiders raining down everywhere. So why do you think there's so many spiders everywhere in that video? Well, that's a great question, Ms. Owens. Thanks for asking. Natural selection is one of the factors affecting natural selection. So what happens with spiders is what happens with a lot of other organisms. They produce more offspring than can survive. So for example, when a spider lays its eggs, like you may have seen this awesome wolf spider video that's online where somebody tries to stomp on or tries to sweep the wolf spider away with a broom and then all its little spider babies go everywhere. That's a perfect example of one of these factors that affects natural selection. Why? Because organisms produce more offspring than can survive. Because especially in the case of spiders like this, some of those might end up dying and those organisms, those spiders in this case, want to be able to pass on their DNA. They want to pass on that genetic material because that's what the DNA wants to do, wants to survive, wants to continue, wants to um, make sure that genetic line, that lineage continues. There's also a lot of variation among individuals in a species. So if you have, look at these bears here in this example, that color is different. The fur coloration is a little bit different. So if you've ever heard the phrase variety is the spice of life, well, there's a lot of variety among individuals in a particular species. If you think about humans and kind of take a look around your classroom, there's a lot of people that have a lot of different characteristics, look a lot different. Different colored eye, different facial structure, different color hair, different heights, all kinds of differences between us. And those are due to genetics. Those are due to your DNA. So inheritance is one word that you may see. And inheritance is just referring to genetics how an organism gets its genetic material, gets its DNA. It's passed on from parent to the offspring. And different variations allow certain individuals to survive better than others. So in this example that we see here, you've got some birds, which apparently these beetles, which kind of look like June bugs to me, are they must be pretty yummy because these birds are eating them. And I guess the green ones taste better. So these birds all like the green beetles, so they're eating them. So what does that leave left over if they eat all the green beetles? Well, it leaves the orange beetles behind. So those orange beetles, since they're not getting eaten, they're going to be able to reproduce, and they're going to pass on their DNA. They're going to pass on their genetic material, and you're going to have fewer green beetles. So eventually, generations later, after those birds have eaten all the green beetles because they were so yummy, then now you just end up having lots of orange beetles and no green beetles. Why do you not have green beetles anymore? Because the birds have eaten all the green beetles and they didn't get to re reproduce and pass on their genetic information. So they didn't procreate. So over time, those individuals that have the beneficial traits are going to be the ones that survive. So in our example of the beetles, apparently a beneficial trait was being orange because that means the bird's not going to eat that colored beetle because I guess it doesn't taste good. So if you look at this example of the alligator here, this is an albino alligator. And this one is just normal coloration, kind of that darkish green color. So which one's going to blend in better in the swamp environment? Well, the normal coloration for the alligator. The albinism is a genetic mutation. And in this case, that's going to be negative to the individual because it is no longer camouflaged in the environment. So it, that genetic mutation, although it increases genetic diversity by having that mutation, it is going to be probably negative for that alligator because something is going to be able to see it and perhaps a predator attack it. Same thing with the 
pythons that you see here, these Burmese pythons. This is the normal coloration for the Burmese python, this kind of tan and black, um, dark brown color. That allows it to blend in with the jungle forest environment, whereas albinism for the Burmese pythons, it's going to be this yellow color skin, yellow and cream white color. So you're definitely going to be able to see this color better out in the wild. So there's two different categories of structures that refer to the anatomy of different organisms and how they may have been related. Analogous structures, one example, and analogous structures are going to be structures in organisms that are similar structures, but they don't indicate that there was a common ancestor. For example, bats have wings, butterflies have wings, birds have wings. That doesn't mean that they descended from the same organism. They just have the same structure. We have arms and legs, and cats have arms and legs, and horses have arms and legs, dinosaurs have arms and legs. That doesn't mean that we all are related in some way necessarily. It means we have the same kind of structure, that quadrupedal um, structure of having four limbs. Homologous structures, your stem homo means same, so homologous structures are going to indicate that there was a common ancestor. So an example of that would be felines, the family Felidae. So you have jaguars and you have pumas and cats and lions and tigers and saber tooth and bobcats. So you have lots of different organisms that are in this mammal family, this Felidae, that are cat-like. And they are all related. They did have common ancestry and common lineage, common DNA. So they have homologous structures. They have similar structures because they have common ancestry. So for example, these guys, they all look cat-like. They all have those sharp pointing fang teeth in the front. Their ears and tails look similar in structure. So they have similar characteristics. So there's two different ways that evolution can occur. One's basically fast and one's slower. So gradualism has the word gradual in it, which refers to slow. So gradualism is a slow and steady process where minor changes are going to occur over time. For example, equus, those are modern day horses. Horses have hooves. But horses, historically, the ancestry of horses, like the mesohippus, they were three-toed horses. So instead of having that one large hoof at the bottom, they actually had three um, phalange. So they had three toes. And you can kind of see the evolution of the horse family here. So they have had a lot of slow changes, minor changes that have occurred. And then punctuated equal equilibrium is going to be when something happens fairly quickly. Punctual time. It's got a specific time frame that it happens. So we've been looking at the paleomastodon, which we know is an example of an ancestor to elephants and mammoths and mastodons. So you can see how it started out the lineage, this family tree with the paleomastodon, and then starts branching out. So for whatever reason, there's some kind of event, some kind of impetus, or something that occurred that made the organism start adapting to their environment better. It could have been due to climate or resources, food availability. Something made these organisms start adapting and start changing and their DNA starting to methylate. So as it gets copied, the beneficial traits are going to get copied more. They're going to be an, an increase in the copying of that DNA that is necessary for passing on those specific traits. And one last thing is a lot of people say evolution says that humans came from monkeys. And that is a myth. That is a misnomer. That's a misconception a lot of people have about evolution. So humans and chimpanzees, humans and different folks in the, the monkey family had common ancestry over 4 million years ago. And Artie, which is a nickname for the Artipithecus ramidus, is an organism that scientists have discovered that uh, humans and other organisms within the um, within the family tree of apes and chimpanzees and monkeys, they have similar DNA from a common ancestor four million years ago, over four million years ago. So no, humans did not come from monkeys. And this is showing you the evolution of what we think of as cavemen, like your ancestors. So you can see this is modern day Homo sapiens. And then you can look at the facial structure and see how organisms have changed throughout time and the different archaeological evidence that scientists have uncovered. 
Thanks, super scientists.